Good morning, church. Good to be with you this morning. <clears throat> My name is Jonathan. I'm the theologian in residence here. And uh, if you're new, well, special welcome to you. If you're joining us online, we're glad you're here. Uh, we're so grateful to gather uh, around the risen Christ today. Uh, before we get into our message, just wanted to give you kind of an announcement. Um, next Sunday, the 21st, we'll be announcing all of our discipleship classes. So we'll roll out uh, all of those from you know, steps to mission of God to Bible class. And for the first time, the Citizens Church Institute. So um, I was hired to, uh, to create something like that. And so we're very excited to be rolling out this fall uh, that institute. We'll be offering uh, over two years, uh, a scope and sequence of 12 classes that kind of cover uh, what we believe, uh, Matthew 28 says, to teach them to obey all that Christ commanded. So the goal of the Institute is to uh, equip Christians to know, uh, obey, and convey all that Christ commanded. And so how do you do that? Well, we've, we've got 12 courses that are not just intellectually informative, but they are practically, I think, transformative. Uh, in the fall, we'll have two uh, seven-week classes, so a full semester. The first class will be gospel, uh, and the second class will be devotion. So they're, they're short, uh, readable books, uh, not super long, so we can uh, manage that. And then there'll be practical. There'll be discussion. There'll be a key project, all w uh, with the attempt to kind of equip you to know, obey, and convey the, all that Christ has commanded. So we're excited about that and just wanted to make that announcement. So registration is open. If you want to get online, poke around. If you have questions, feel free to email me, and uh, we'd love to see you this fall. All right, let's um, pray, and then we'll, we'll get into this. <clears throat> oh, Lord Christ, thank you that you are the cornerstone that you are the one who holds all things together, that you are unshakable, um, that you are eternal, and that you are present. A great cornerstone, would you make your presence known as we reflect on this really delightful topic today, the topic of play. Would you meet us, Christ, who plays in 10,000 places, uh, the, the Christ of joy, the Christ of suffering, the Christ of uh, sovereignty, and the Christ of intimacy. Would you meet us now as we reflect on your eternal word? Would you invite us into your own joy, into play? We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. We're in a short series called Rhythms, and we're exploring the rhythms of rest and work and play and today, we're looking at the topic of play. And summer's a great time to think about that, right? We, we're, we're swimming, we're vacationing, we're seeing blockbuster movies. And so, what a great time to reflect on play. What is the meaning of play? Uh, what are the obstacles to, to play? Um, is, is that really a biblical category, <laughs> play? Uh, and how might we, how might we en enjoy play? So, let's think about this. What is play? Um, is it really a biblical category, and how do we do it? What is play? If you take these two words we're kind of looked at so far, rest and play, you put them together, uh, those, those are wonderful words, right? They put a smile on your face. Rest and play. Who doesn't want to do that? <laughs> They're not like, um, you know, anxious and sad. Rest and play are joyful words. They're, they're words that kind of draw our attention. Um, but what exactly is Play. One way to conceive of play is by thinking about what it's not. It's not work, right? Uh, and you might say it's non-work. That's one way to define play is non-work. Um, if we're not working, we could be playing. And in fact, while we're working, we may daydream of playing. Like, I can't wait to get out of here and get on the golf course. Or I can't wait for the day to come to the end and, and just to get a break from the kids and have adult conversation or do something that I want to do. Right? We might even dream of playing while we're working. We, we are made for play. It, clearing hump day, we might begin to check movie times. We may begin to check out new restaurants. Perhaps we could book a reservation. Uh, we begin to think about maybe concerts. We, we are looking forward to play in the middle of our work. And if you, uh, well, maybe some of you 
You just want to sleep in. <laughs> As you look ahead to the weekend, it's not so much play as it is rest. But we all kind of have this experience, don't we? Uh, the longing to play. And if we push rest and play together, you get leisure. It's not a, ter a term we use much these days, but leisure is kind of a combination of rest and play. And uh, if we think about this, we actually often work in order to play. Like our work finances our leisure. Uh, we, we think about the money we make and the discretionary income we have in order to plan a vacation or to do something that we enjoy. Um, so as we think about what is play, uh, often work is a part of that. Uh, and we may think of it surely, just merely in terms of non-work. Another way to think of play is uh, not what it's not, but what it is. <laughs> and play is lighthearted, isn't it? Play is fun. Uh, play is frivolous. Um, we pulled into our neighborhood July 4th weekend, and uh, on the corner of a lot, grassy lot, we saw a bunch of kids gathered playing wiffle ball and just put a smile on our face. You know, July 4th out there playing uh, baseball, and it just made us happy. Why? Why, why does play uh, put a smile on our face? Well, they, they were playing. I mean, they, they, were, they, they, were, they were kind of, there were no responsibilities, right? They were free. They were unrestrained. There's a kind of joy of, of not having anything to do but to do something that brings you happiness. Why does play evoke delight? Why does it? Because play has no responsibilities. Play has no really restraints. It has no other goal than itself. Now, when we work, we work to provide. When we exercise, we exercise to get fit or to be healthy. But when we play, we play to play. We play for the playfulness of play. We, we play. Um, I, I think of my daughter running around our living room floor with Winston, our new puppy, you know, just squealing for joy. And the, the play, you know, I think of the kids on the, the corner. I think of my wife's laughter over a long extended meal with friends. The frivolity, the play. Play is, uh, is also musical. Uh, Austin, where I come from, uh, after 20 years, is the live music capital of the world. And inevitably, if you're on Congress Avenue, you walk down, you'll see people uh, playing music. You'll see a guy with a kind of makeshift drum set. You'll see someone in the corner with their guitar. And they're not busking. They're not asking for money. They're not pandering. They're playing just to play. They're playing for the joy of it. Sheer play. And that frivolity draws us, but it also can be difficult. It can be difficult to enter into that play. It, you know, it, it can be hard for us. It, often as we mature, we think, uh, I've got to be responsible. <laughs> I've got to pay the bills. Uh, I've got to have goals. I've got to, you know, keep the family in order. I mean, and, and suddenly life becomes kind of heavy and serious. And as we mature, we often lose this sense of play. And we often actually equate maturity with a lack of playfulness. What happens? What happens? Ben Witherington, a New Testament scholar, uh, says that, that, that play beckons us because play uh, opens a person to joy. It opens you up to joy. You slow down, you create space for it, you enter into it. In play, we create a sp space for joy. You think about it, we're not, we're not fixing, <laughs> we're not working, we're not serving. Uh, we are enjoying in the moment a play. Sociologist Peter Berger says, joy is the intention of play. That's the driving force behind play. And he goes on to describe play as a joy in play as a kind of signal, a signal of transcendence. That, that joy is, is from, from beyond. Play opens us up to joy, a joy that's beyond us, a, a joy that is a signal of transcendence. And if it's that wonderful, why do we find it so hard to play sometimes? If, it that, if, it, if it's that great, uh, what are the obstacles to play? Is it age? Is it maturity? Uh, my father is in his 70s, and he's one of the most playful people I know. He's always curiously asking all the grandkids questions. He'll play with them. He'll wrestle with them. Um, he travels the world with his wife. He's a very playful uh, person. 
Now, is he irresponsible? No, he's been quite responsible, uh, a man of great esteem in my eyes. Uh, but he is a playful person. So age is not the obstacle to play. Well, then what is it? What is it that keeps us from play? Theologian J.I. Packer suggests there are two obstacles to leisure. The first is pragmatic leisure. The pragmatist sees rest as a way to get more done. So you, you go on vacation or to be charged up for work. We often use this in our language. We'll, we'll say, well, I, I just need to uh, get my batteries charged. Why? So I can get more done. The, the batteries have to be charged up in order to execute more when I get back to the office or home or at to work. Uh, we, we might say, um, I just need to refuel, right? What are you refueling for? Not for happiness, not for joy, but for work, right? And so, so it's even kind of embedded in our language, this pragmatic approach to play. You might say play is enslaved to productivity. <clears throat> I fell into this in my 20s, and I struggled with it for a couple decades. <laughs> this idea that I actually rest to work or play. And when I got away for any length of time, a sneaky little voice would pop up, and it would whisper to me, you better make something of this. And I can remember a trip to Vancouver with my wife. We just went for the fun. You know, just a, a fun trip, no agenda. We didn't even plan that much. And when I got on the plane, I was like, I'll start with a novel, start reading a novel. And I heard this little voice, you better get some great sermon insights out of this book. A sneaky little voice coming in and say, you better rest so you can work. Right? Your play has got to serve productivity. Um, there we were walking around the crisp Canadian air out of the Texas heat. And um, as we were walking around, I heard another little voice just kind of come up and just say, um, you better make this trip worth it. <laughs> Stealing my joy. You ever get that voice? You ever hear that whisper? That little thief of joy? You know, the little, the little taskmaster of work coming to, 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 uh, to ruin your play, right? A hedonistic uh, not hedonistic, pragmatic approach to play. The other, Packer says, is the hedonistic approach to leisure. This might be the, the other half of the room. If the pragmatist idolizes productivity, then the hedonist idolizes pleasure. So the, this person that doesn't have any problem justifying play, like you know, they can play all day, or right? perhaps they, they play too much. Uh, this person can line up the experiences and knock them out with joy, right? There, there's no restraint when it comes to play. Uh, the, they enjoy uh, new friends, uh, new shows, uh, new food. They're all, this person's always experiencing new things in the pursuit uh, of, of play. You, you, what's wrong with that? The hedonist mistakes pleasure for joy. The pleasure is temporary, but joy is eternal. The hedonist tries to squeeze joy out of pleasure, but it's trying to get blood from a stone. It doesn't work, squeezing uh, joy out of pleasure. So it's more episodes, it's more clothes, it's more watches, it's more cars, it's more relationships, it's more encounters, it's more restaurants, it's more drinks, it's more, more, more. And the thing about pleasure is that it always leaves us <laughs> wanting more. But joy has this deep, satisfying effect, the eternal joy. I'm not saying pleasure's bad. <laughs> I'm just saying it's nowhere near as good as joy. So the pragmatist and the hedonist, they miss the intention of play. I wonder, which way do you lean? What, what, what is your obstacle to joyful play. You say, well, my, my obstacles, is, is it even a biblical idea? <laughs> uh, is this a category in the scriptures? If you did a word search for play in the Bible, uh, you would come up with mostly negative things like uh, playing the whore or playing the fool. There are a few exceptions to that, uh, the, the children playing or playing a lyre and playing a harp. But the idea of joyful play is all over the Bible. And, uh, and so let's look at a few instances of that. Psalm 149. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. 
Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. Notice the many expressions of play we've talked about. There's singing, uh, there's dancing, uh, there is music, right? There is a playfulness present in this psalm. Why? Why is it there? Because they have uncovered it in their maker. They have found joy in their king. You see, joy is tied to something greater than us. German philosopher Joseph Piper made an interesting observation. He said, the soul of leisure is celebration. The soul, the heart, the center of leisure is celebration. The heartbeat of play is festivity. And so Piper goes on to argue that many of the festivals throughout cultures were tied to a deity. They were celebration of some kind of deity and and some uh, thing that the deity gave humanity. Well, if you think about that, we come back to the Old Testament, there are a lot of festivals. There are seven key festivals in the Old Testament uh, that, that were practiced that were uh, very festive. They were joyful occasions, celebratory. Uh, I think of the feast, the feast of first fruits, or the Feast of Booze, or the Feast of Passover, a feast in which people gathered, and they drank, and they celebrated, and they ate, and they were filled with joy. And each one of those festivals revolved around not joy, not celebration, but God. The God of joy, the God of festivity, the God of the harvest, the God of the first fruits, uh, the the God of rescue, the God of Passover. Uh, God was at the center of those celebrations. So, uh, if leisure is the soul of celebration, then Christians should have the corner on joy. Uh, We should be the most playful people on the planet uh, because we know where play comes from. We know the source of eternal joy. You say, okay, but that's the past. That's the Old Testament. And we don't really do those festivals anymore as Christians. Well, the Bible doesn't just uh, kind of make a case for play from the past. It justifies uh, leisure from from the future. One scholar notes that play is momentary escape into the future. And you know, you feel it. Like when you're playful, it's kind of you lose track of time. There's a gladness that's outside of you that's kind of inside of you at the same time. I mean, it's, you know, it's like an escape into, into the future. Remember the children playing? Remember the musicians on the corner just playing to play? Uh, it's something, uh, the signal, the signal of transcendence to something that is beyond. Well, where does that signal come from? The signal comes from the sacred mountain. The signal comes from the sacred mountain. Have you ever noticed that when you're in the mountains it, that you kind of are just filled with awe and joy? We, we go to Colorado most uh, summers, and I'll walk to the edge of this mountain. I'll look out at, at the Gore Valley and see 16,000-foot peaks in the distance, and I'll just be filled with joy. I'll be struck with awe. Well, it turns out that humans have been doing this kind of thing for, uh, for centuries and centuries. The Sumerians uh, built temples on top of mountains. That's where the gods were said to visit. Uh, the Egyptian pyramids were little hillocks, like little mini hills. That's why they're triangular. Uh, and, they were, and that was where the god Ray was said to rule. Um, the uh, <clears throat> Mount Olympus, uh, the, that's the mountain of the Greeks, where the gods dwelled. And the, uh, the, there was the food of the gods uh, flowing, the ambrosia. And in fact, the Garden of Eden was on a lush mountain, rivers flowing down, precious stones littering uh, the garden, a place of, of, of great peace and joy. What do all of these mountain scenes have in common? The gods live on the mountain. Well, no wonder they're transcendent. In fact, the prophets describe our future on a mountain. Uh, Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. A people who delight, a people who rejoice, a people who celebrate. God's people will one day gather on a cosmic mountain 
not merely to work or to rest, (laughs) but to play. Zechariah also talks about our future. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and on the mountain of the Lord of hosts. The holy mountain, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with a staff in hand because of great age, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. What an endearing vision. Uh, Why is this significant? Uh, the, the, The elderly can sit because there's, there's no war. There's nothing to fear. The children can play because they're safe. In fact, the word street is usually associated with a place of refuge and conflict. But in the cosmic mountain, in the future of God's people, that place becomes a playful place. It becomes a safe place. So you see, the future uh, that we have on the cosmic mountain is a, is a place of safety. It's a place of joy. Isaiah goes on to describe uh, the Christians, uh, the God's people, as possessors of the mountain. They're profaners of the mountain, and then there are possessors of the mountain. What does it mean to be a possessor? It means it's yours. It's, the mountain is yours. Uh, the joy of the mountain, the festivity of the mountain, the hope of the mountain, the safety of the mountain, the peace of the mountain is yours. Possessors of the mountain. And in fact, the Bible ends on a mountain. Revelation 21, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. A picture of the city of God in all of its splendor, all of its beauty on a mountain a cosmic mountain fit for all who hope in Christ. Why? Because the mountain is where God dwells in unmatched glory. No wonder we're happy. (laughs) We're close. We're present. We dwell on the cosmic mountain. So when uh, we think of play, it's kind of a thing that brings the future into the present. Uh, it's, um, it's a tapping into that signal of transcendence, emitting from the sacred mountain. It's a place of eternal celebration, Mount Zion. I think of this line in the Matrix. Uh, the, the operator is working in the ship, and they're trying to rescue people from this uh, kind of fallen world, the, the digital cyborg, the matrix. And the, the operator turns to Neo and says, when it's all over, the party will be in Zion. That's it. That's it. When it's all over, the party's going to be in Zion. And it'll be on a mountain, the city of God. We thought about what is play. We thought about obstacles to play. We thought of the biblical category of play. But what does it look like to play? How do you put it into practice? And I think we all know. I mean, it's intuitive. We're made for play. We recognize play. The stories and images resonate with us as we think about the playfulness of play. What we probably need, many of us, is permission to play. Permission to play. And here we have it, straight from the cosmic mountain, from the Lord of hosts, from the King of Zion, giving us permission to play. So go for that bike ride. Uh, Eat some ice cream with your kids. You know, watch a movie, um, <clears throat> wrestle with your kids on the floor, go for a walk, go to a mountain <laughs> and take in God's glory. Sing to the Lord, but whatever you do, do it festivity, with festivity. Piper says this, the most festive festival possible is to celebrate in divine worship. That's the, that's the creme de la creme. That's the zenith of playful joy is divine worship. And as it turns out, each of those festivals that are part of our heritage are all fulfilled in Christ. So the festival of booze is also the festival of temples. And then we find out in Revelation 22 that there's no need for a temple because God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Where do we worship? We worship there at the foot of the Lamb. The festival uh, of first fruits is fulfilled in Christ. We find in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ is the first fruits of all those who are raised from the dead. Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. 
And then there's, of course, the festival of the Passover. Uh, the Passover is what? It's the slaying of a lamb so that people can go free. The lamb who takes away the sin of the world, slain for us so we can be free, so we can be unrestrained, so we can experience eternal joy, so we can live on the mountain safe and secure, worshiping the God and the lamb forever and ever. So let's follow the signal back to the sacred mountain. Let's apply the sermon on the spot in worship of our great God and celebrate the transcendent source of our joy. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for being a God of joy, of play, of creativity. Uh, Lord, often that's not how we conceive of you. We conceive of you as a moral being or as a uh, someone beyond us or a suffering servant, a messiah, a rescuer. But so often we lose sight that you are, in fact, the source of eternal joy. Would you rescue us from broken or incomplete visions of who you are? And would you restore to us the joy of our salvation as we turn to you, Lord, in faith, as we turn to you perhaps in repentance over our broken, our broken views of play? as we enjoy the forgiveness of Christ and the presence of the glory of God. Lord, meet us as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.